Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our Head and Neck Anatomy series. This video will cover the eye muscles. So first we'll start with the extraocular eye muscles, and all of these are innervated by cranial nerve 3, which is the oculomotor nerve, except for two of them. We usually have one exception. This is the time that we have two exceptions to the rule. So the function of these muscles is to move the eye, just like the extrinsic tongue muscles move the tongue and the extrinsic ear muscles move the ear. The only exception, though, is the levator palpebrae superioris, which actually moves the upper eyelid. So let's start with that one and go down the list. So levator palpebrae superioris elevates the upper eyelid. It originates from the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. It inserts into, of course, the upper eyelid. And we already covered its action, innervated by cranial nerve 3. Then we have the superior oblique muscle, which is this one right here. It originates on the sphenoid, sphenoid bone just medial to the optic canal, and it inserts into the lateral surface of the eyeball. It acts by abducting, depressing, and intorting the eye, which means a medial rotation of the eye. It hooks around the trochlea, which is this little tendinous sling. It forms this pulley-like structure, and that's an important thing to know for the board exam. Sometimes they ask you about that directly. And this muscle is our first exception of the video. This one's innervated by cranial nerve 4 instead of cranial nerve 3. Now the really nice thing about this is that the name of cranial nerve 4 is the trochlear nerve. And that's how it gets its name because this muscle, the only muscle it innervates, hooks around the trochlea. Next we have the inferior oblique muscle that's down here. It originates on the maxilla, inserts into that same lateral surface of the eyeball, and it does the opposite. It abducts, elevates, and extorts the eye, which means it laterally rotates the eye. The lateral rectus muscle originates from the annulus of Zinn. This is a fancy word. It's the common tendinous ring of the eye. It's this ring of fibrous tissue surrounding the optic nerve near the entrance uh, at the apex of the orbit. It inserts into the lateral surface of the eyeball right here, and it abducts the eye. And this is our other exception for the video, and it inter it's innervated by cranial nerve 6 instead of cranial nerve 3. Now the cool thing about this one is that the name of cranial nerve 6 is the abducens muscle, and the abducens muscle enables the lateral rectus to abduct the eye, pulling the eye away from the nose. And that's how, uh, you know, that's how I remember those things because the abducens muscle is the abducens nerve, which is cranial nerve 6, gets its name because it's innervating. The only muscle that it innervates is acting by abducting the eye. A fun little mnemonic I left down here is SO4LR6, which stands for superior oblique 4 and lateral rectus cranial nerve 6. Just a helpful little tool to help you remember those two exceptions. The superior rectus muscle is right here. It's hiding underneath that superior oblique muscle. It also originates from the annulus of Zinn, the back of the orbit. It inserts into the superior surface of the eyeball and it adducts, elevates, and intorts the eye. The inferior rectus is hiding underneath the inferior oblique muscle. It originates also from the annulus, inserts into the inferior surface of the eyeball, and it adducts and depresses the eye. And lastly, we have the medial rectus, also originates from the annulus, inserts into the medial surface of the eyeball, which is hidden in this image, and it acts by adducting the eye. Note that all four of the rectus muscles originate from this annulus. You might be able to remember that by remembering 
remembering that they both end in us. And let's talk about the intraocular eye muscles. These are rings of smooth muscle that function to change the shape of the eye, just like our previous intrinsic muscles, by changing the lens and the pupil. These muscles are innervated by cranial nerve 3 as well. There is one exception, though, that's innervated by V1. So we'll start with the ciliary muscle. And this muscle that surrounds the lens of the eye helps in accommodation for near vision. In other words, it changes the shape of the lens to allow closer objects to come into focus as projected onto our retina. This is controlled primarily by the parasympathetic nervous system, and those fibers are primarily from the short ciliary nerves that feed into the oculomotor nerve. Again, cranial nerve 3 is very active in all of these eye muscles. The sphincter pupillae muscle refers to the inner circular fibers right against and right around the pupil of the eye. This muscle is also called the iris sphincter. Of course, the pupil is this black opening at the center of the colored iris that surrounds it. And when this muscle contracts, that hole or that pupil gets smaller. So it has the same nerve supply as the ciliary muscles, so these two work hand in hand. And this one, of course, is going to constrict the pupil, which is called meiosis. Constriction of the pupil is called meiosis. The parasympathetic nerve fibers of the oculomotor nerve via the short ciliary nerves is, is what's going to innervate this muscle. It makes sense that this is a parasympathetic nervous system action because pupil constriction is something that we've linked up with in our pharmacology series. We've talked about this, how something that is a uh, rest and digest or feed and breed response is consistent with pupil constriction. And this is why, because the parasympathetic nervous system, when it fires, is causing this smooth muscle to activate and causing the pupil to constrict. The opposite of that is the dilator pupillae. These are those outer radial fibers. It's also called the iris dilator, and this will cause the very opposite thing to happen. When this muscle contracts, it pulls the pupil wider in order to let more light into the eye. So pupil dilation is known as mydriasis. Mydriasis is linked up with a sympathetic nervous system fight or flight response. And so the sympathetic nervous system fibers are coming from V1, which is the uh, ophthalmic branch of the uh, trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, which feed into the nasociliary nerve, which become and branch off into the long ciliary nerves that feed this muscle. So the really cool thing about this, kind of bringing it all together, is that every nerve that we talked about in this video, that's cranial nerve 3, 4, V1, and 6, 3, 4, V1, and 6, are the four nerves that are transmitted via the superior orbital fissure that we talked about in our foramen video. And that's exactly why, because it opens into the orbit and all four of these nerves are able to supply all of these different eye muscles that we talked about. So really cool, that's why I love anatomy. It builds on itself and all of it makes sense when you put it all together in the big picture. All right, so that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.